Hello, this is Dr. C, and uh, today I'm going to talk about and go over some highlights within Chapter 4 of the OpenStax 2nd Edition Psychology Textbook. And I'm, I'm walking through the PowerPoint presentation file that you have in class. And if you don't have it, you can just listen along. And I'm not going to cover every single subject, but I'm going to highlight a few as we walk through this uh, lecture. And for this particular one, I'm going to try to walk through the entire uh, chapter in one recording instead of splitting it up. So if it gets a little long and you're nodding off and falling asleep, just pause it and resume later. Okay? No biggie. All right. So this is the chapter called Consciousness. That's typical in every Intro to Psychology class. And at first glance, it might be a little confusing as to what this chapter is about. But our consciousness has to do with our levels of awareness, okay? And what our senses can pick up. So, for example, when we're awake, we have very high levels of sensory awareness, right? So, when you're alert and awake, you're aware of your thoughts and your actions and what you smell, <laughs> not what you smell like, but what you're able to smell, what you're able to see and hear, etc. Okay, so these are our um, experiences. Okay, and one subject that I do want to highlight here has to do with our biological rhythms. And this is how our body is able to regulate itself on a cycle. So your body has a regulation mechanism, uh, whether it's, uh, as an example, a woman's menstrual cycle, for example, your level of alertness will vary in a 24-hour period, including your sleep. So sleep cycles are mentioned in the consciousness chapter, as well as your body temperature will change during certain parts of the day and night. Now one I want to talk about in particular is the circadian rhythm, not to be confused with Canadian rhythm, whatever that might be. <laughs> okay. Um, the bio, it's a biological rhythm that encompasses 24 hours and is generated by a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN. Okay, And there is a gland in our body that produces melatonin that you've probably heard of and that is affected by our exposure to light. Okay, And so... The circadian rhythm is related to our environment in terms of the natural light and dark cycle. Um, we go camping quite a bit and enjoy being in nature and we notice that even though we have our devices with us, we more or less follow the sunrise and sunset. Um, and oftentimes if you're camping in a tent, you really are going to follow that because you're you're not in an apartment or house where sometimes if you're in a dark room um, so when we swap uh, lodging going to our in-law my in-laws house versus staying at my father's house for example in Texas uh, the rooms are different and then different access to light in our in-laws house it's like we're sleeping in a cave they're very dark curtains and you don't even feel it when the sun comes out and that can really affect your sleep cycle and other, there are other things that will affect it as well such as travel and so forth so let's talk a little bit about that um, but in essence our body our bodies and our alertness cycles are connected to nature in a sense of daylight versus nighttime okay and the suprachiasmatic nucleus is located in the hypothalamus, and that's our brain's internal clock, okay? And what is also affected by our internal clock is our exposure to light, right? That goes through our eyes, that stimulates the pineal gland that either shuts down or produces melatonin, the uh, hormone. So let's take a look at that, okay? So when we're sleeping, assuming that it's dark, right? then our um, body will release melatonin, okay? 
So when, we're, when our eyes are exposed to light, particularly sunlight, then it shuts down or inhibits the release of melatonin. Okay, And that's why for people who are jet lagged and they take melatonin as a supplement, you take it at night. You don't take that during the day. During the day. Okay, And um, let me talk a little bit about uh, jet lag. It's very serious actually. Um, when we used to travel between the U.S. and Asia, that's a really huge shift, uh, 12 to 14 hour time difference. So day is night and night is day, right? And that first week to 10 days can be very challenging. I remember many years ago, we came back to the States, and that's when I had a uh, on-campus full-time faculty position. So the schedule was, was you know, didn't have a lot of time off. We came back, and then pretty much the next work day, I went to work. Now, I remember that week, especially in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, that would be in Asia, it would be the middle of the night, right, equivalent. And I remember the jet lag and the drowsiness would hit without warning when I was driving. And it's not like your typical long-distance drive where you slowly feel drowsy. It just came on really strong and abruptly. It's very, very dangerous. And so, um, and people have gotten into really bad accidents or have been killed when they're jet lagged in operating a motor vehicle for example so you can get very fatigued and sluggish and I remember one of the colleges I work for now a year or two ago they were going to go to Vietnam I think in Southeast Asia to open up a sister campus or some sort of program and they were inviting faculty members to go but the trip was only four days and I was thinking you're not even going to get get over jet lag in four days. What's the point of spending all that money to fly all the way to Asia? And are you going to have your meetings at, you know, two in the morning there? <laughs> you know? And I, I really didn't understand. And I don't understand. Well, I guess I can. I mean, I have friends who have very limited vacation time. And they would go to Asia for two weeks. And I'm like, wow, that's really not enough time to really enjoy it. It's going to be a rush. And that's not our lifestyle. We... When we go somewhere, we go for months at a time. And luckily, because I teach only online, I'm able to do that. All right, so I'm not going to get into too much of that. But also people who are into shift work. Um, I know many of my students are nursing majors or, or already work in the medical field. And if you work the overnight shift, you really have to set up a situation where your room during the day has to be extremely dark for you to get sleep, uh, for your brain to produce that melatonin. Um, so I think m long periods of this sort of upside down work sh schedule, work at night and sleep in the day, can, can take a toll on one's body. So I'm not sure how many people can do that for many years at a time, actually. Um, and uh, it says here on the slide that, and I agree, of course, that um, this this extended shift work over time can create feelings of exhaustion, agitation, sleeping problems, and can lead to depression or anxiety. Right? And if you think about sleep deprivation, just not getting enough sleep on a periodic basis or chronic basis, um, I think, especially for college students, I remember my experience is that Sleep was the one thing everyone sacrificed, that they'll take caffeine pills or do whatever, you know, drink Jolt Cola, I don't know if that's still around, that had a lot of caffeine in it, and we would study and pull all-nighters and, and things like that, and, and we didn't think anything of it, we didn't think it was harmful, we just figured you can make it up later or whatever, but sleep deprivation can actually be uh, a very uh, damaging kind of lifestyle so sleep debt is a term that pretty much is like money debt right it's insufficient sleep on a chronic basis and I know a lot of college students especially my college students who are in community college they have full-time jobs and taking care of family a lot of responsibilities and taking a lot of classes and the one thing that's gonna give is your sleep unfortunately and Think about these things that happen when someone's sleep deprived, right? You're definitely going to be irritable, and it's really apparent. It's really easy to see. Um, 
It could uh, increase one's risk of heart disease over time, decrease the, or increase reaction time, right? Which means it takes longer to react to something. So when one's driving, that's kind of what I talked about before. Um, one might feel muscle tremors, right? Uh, if someone's younger, it might suppress growth. And this is interesting. I think most of my students, when reading about the effects of sleep deprivation, they're very surprised about this, is that it could be related to an increased rate of obesity, okay? And you would think, well, you're sleeping less, your body's moving more when you're awake. Why would you become obese? And that is because uh, this lack of sleep, because sleep has, a, and we'll talk about in a second, has a lot of restorative functions and just interfering with this natural cycle can affect the biochemistry of the body to where um, it can increase one's weight. Um, impaired immune system, right? Uh, risk of diabe diabetes. Uh, <laughs> I like this one, severe yawning. Have you ever had yawns where you're, uh, it almost hurts you to yawn, that they're so strong? Uh, sometimes when I remember when I'm driving and if I yawn really intensely, it's almost to the point where I can't even keep my eyes open to see while I'm yawning. Uh, all right, so you see a lot of consequences of sleep deprivation. On this next chart, next chart, you'll see the age in one column, recommended hours of sleep in the next column, and appropriate range of sleep, and then not recommended sleep. So just an example, let's just pick 18 to 25 year olds. So it's recommended that you sleep between seven to nine hours. And, and yes, you can get by with less, such as it says may be appropriate minimum of 6 or maximum of 10 to 11 so if you stretch that out a little bit you can get away with it depending on the person but it's not recommended to have fewer than 6 or more than 11 so oftentimes people who don't sleep enough or sleep too much it can be a symptom of depression or anxiety it's one of the items on the checklist for depression or anxiety is sleep cycle that is no longer normal for that person and we'll talk about it a lot later when we talk about psychological disorders and how those are defined, okay? All right, so for every stage of one's life in terms of age, there's recommended. Of course, you know that newborns sleep a lot. So it's included in this chart as well, between 14 to 17. Can you imagine 14 to 17 hours of sleep <laughs> in a given day for newborns? Um, and by the 4th to 11th month, that decreases to 12 to 15 first couple of years as a toddler then it's 11 to 14 so it's not until really 6 to 13 uh, that that um, primary school age that the recommended hours of sleep are 9 to 11 but if you think about younger kids these days if they have mobile devices and access to computers and there's or video games and they're staying up later and later and later um, if they're really not getting eight hours of sleep that's that's going to affect their development Okay, um, in this particular slide, we're going to talk about the definition of sleep, and it seems kind of straightforward that we have sleep and wake cycles, but what is the purpose of sleep, okay? Well, first of all, sleep is related to many of our hormones, uh, so prop having a proper sleep cycle can regulate these hormone levels as well, and we saw earlier that uh, the sleep-wake cycles are controlled by our exposure to light and, uh, and certain parts of the brain as well like the hypoth hypothalamus okay now this is interesting I think most of us don't really think about the purpose of sleep other than that we have to is that under evolutionary psychology there's a hypothesis that sleeping is adaptive right it's restorative to restore basically to recharge to restore our resources so having a good night's sleep can help us to reduce stress and get us ready for the next day okay um now the trouble with evolutionary psychology is it's very hard to prove those kinds of ideas that sleep is an adaptive response to predatory risks right uh, which increases in darkness so if you have more sleep you're more alert um but this is but these particular benefits of sleep are shown in research that cognitively it helps us all right um, it helps us in terms of our memory okay so really if you think about it, if you're studying for an exam that's coming up and you're trying to restore a lot of information in your brain right 
but you're decreasing the amount of sleep because you want to study more. Now, if you compare two students, one who gets a lot of sleep the night before an exam versus someone who's trying to pull that all-nighter, I would bet that, that person who, of course, they also studied, but did not decrease their amount of sleep beforehand. So increasing the amount of sleep can actually be an aid in doing well on a test because you don't want to be sleep deprived during okay so it can, so having sleep deprivation can disrupt your cognitive state your level of thinking and your memory okay and that's not something you want to do over time you will remember more if you get the uh, proper amount of sleep so that is something that's come about in recent years in research that uh, Having a good night's sleep can, can really help you form new memories and remember things better, okay? Um, also, it can lower your stress level, improving your mood, okay? And so sleep has become a real focus of research in the past few years, and more of that is making its way into the public. If you go on YouTube or go to TED.com, you'll see a lot of TED Talks related to sleep and, uh, and how important it is. And there are many influential people who swear by this, you know, one of the tips of doing well in life is getting enough rest, getting enough sleep. Now, insomnia actually can be a clinical condition, okay? And it's defined by either having a difficult time falling asleep, which is what most people think of when they think of insomnia, or when you wake up in the middle of the night, but you cannot fall asleep. So that is defined as staying asleep. And one way to diagnose this is that does it happen chronically at least three times a week, okay, for at least a month, then that's a, that's a pattern, right? If it happens once in a while, then it's not a big deal, but it's the most common sleep disorder. So sleep disorders are consider, considered psychological disorders. A lot of people may not think it's that serious, but there are a lot of different kinds of sleep disorders um, that are uh, very disruptive. And like I said earlier, a disruption in sleep, either sleeping too much or not enough, can be a symptom of depression. So insomnia could be related to one's age, could be related to drug use, legal or illegal. Um, could be related to maybe not getting enough exercise or one's mental status and your bedtime routine, right? Um, there is such a thing as sleep hygiene, and this is something we learned um, during my clinical training years at the hospital. There's a sleep clinic, uh, and also it was part of a stress management clinic there. And they tried to help people manage stress using non-pharmaceutical or psychological methods. Okay, so instead of just taking a sleeping pill, we talk about sleep hygiene. I think when I did my internship, smartphones really wasn't a thing at that point. It was the year 1999. 1998 to 99 right so we pretty much lived on dumb phones so we weren't staring at our phones late at night maybe computers but it, it really wasn't that big that back then using the net internet but nowadays sleep hygiene has really been horrible i think we have our mobile devices we keep them in the bedroom it's the last thing we look at at night the first thing we look at in the morning and the light that's emitted from phones can interfere with your melatonin production, so it makes it harder to sleep at night. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. You feel like you're not sleepy, so you pass the time by staring at the phone, which even makes you even less sleepy, and therefore you're going to become an insomniac and not get the amount of sleep and become sleep deprived, and you're just not as uh, alert and productive during the day. Right, so it becomes so an example of sleep hygiene training would be to remove devices so that the bedroom where you sleep is only for sleeping, right? Not for watching TV, not for playing video games. There are no glowing devices in the bedroom, and I know that's really difficult to do, but you basically use that space to sleep, right? Now, if you cannot fall asleep right away, actually reading a book is not a bad thing. Um, but you don't want to do anything that's overly mentally stimulating, okay? Get up, maybe go for a, listen to music or walk around the house a little bit, then try to go back to sleep or only go to the bedroom when you're feeling sleepy, but then leave all your devices outside. Then slowly what's going to happen is that 
there's going to be an association with the bedroom and sleeping that the bedroom is not a place of mental activity is a place for rest okay and so sleep hygiene training is important um, stress management like meditation could also be helpful in reducing stress to help one sleep right um, through counseling maybe talking about issues that are influencing their life behavior patterns smoking maybe drug use or alcohol use could interfere and so cognitive behavioral therapy which we'll discuss in the chapter on treatments is one of the most popular forms of counseling and it can be helpful so if sleep is a symptom of a disruption in your life right that sleep is not the problem in your life sleep is just a symptom that's hinting that there are deeper issues then addressing those deeper issues can be helpful now the problem with seeing your general practitioner who's an MD right and medical doctors focus on your biology they don't really focus on your daily habits and your relationships with people and your psychology right um, and that's unfortunate in the American medical system is that we have this split between what's happening with our body versus what's happening with our mind and there you don't generally see the same professional for both which is unfortunate because if you had a more holistic type of treatment or training with your doctor then instead of just asking how much are you sleeping oh that's bad let me give you a sleeping pill to help you sleep or a prescription instead they would talk about well what are the things that are going on in your life that may be different than your your old normal when you were able to sleep properly is it turbulence in the marriage is it stress at work or a work change is it the increase in alcohol use right and today's doctors don't have that kind of time or mindset to dig into all those things to encourage you to change behavior change your environment right uh, talk about sleep hygiene most physicians and I'm not knocking the profession but this is just their training they're gonna look at a symptom oh sleep problem let's look at what medications can address that and that's what really what you're gonna get um, and the same thing is if you talk to your doctor about not feeling good feeling anxious feeling depressed they're gonna get out that pad and write your prescription instead of talking about life changes where and that's unfortunately split into a different profession where you see a social worker or a psychologist or a counselor versus your medical doctor all right now there's a category of sleep disorders that are called parasomnias okay and these are uh, are more involved in terms of uh, muscle movement and bodily movement so whenever you see motor behavior the word motor uh, that's referring to our muscles and muscular action okay and so some people sleepwalk right and most people who sleepwalk don't remember that they do okay and sometimes it could be harmful sometimes it could be very innocent sometimes it could be involving as making a sandwich making something to eat and then going back to bed um, but you can imagine it can be quite dangerous what if you unlock the door and start walking outside right so sleepwalking can be quite harmful um, there are other things that happen during uh, REM sleep okay and sometimes it's called uh, uh, restless restless leg syndrome right where uh, you just feel very uncomfortable and you keep shaking your legs and, and, and you just don't feel calm when trying to sleep and there is also night terrors where people have particular uh, bad dreams where they feel a sense of panic and scream and and try to escape right uh, normally when we're sleeping we are physically paralyzed and that's a protective function right um, normally during REM sleep our bodies can't move and that's when we're dreaming usually so that our bodies are not acting out our dream and um, and sometimes you can injure your mate in bed if you're physically uh, moving around violently and hitting them accidentally okay and so there are various types of disorders that are related to a disruption in our sleep now a couple of these you may have heard of one's called sleep apnea 
and the other one's called narcolepsy, and sometimes people get these two things confused. Sleep apnea is where there's a blockage in one's breathing during their sleep, during nighttime when they're sleeping, okay? It can last between 10 and 20 seconds, right? And so if one is awakened by that, right, then it can really cause lack of sleep, sleep deprivation, right, uh, a lot of anxiety, and it's more common in people who are overweight, right? So a person can either have an obstructive kind of sleep apnea where their airway is blocked, right? Or a central nervous system failure where you're not getting the signals from the brain to continue your breathing, right? So a CPAP device you may have heard of that some people use to help people sleep. They may use that at night, okay? I know in the RV camping world, people talk about which kinds of batteries you can use to, to plug this in, uh, you know, does it work in the car and so forth. So uh, if, if those who know will know that uh, you need a particular kind of battery that produces, I think, a, a sinusoidal wave, I believe. I'll have to look that up. But you have to be careful of how you use that on the go if you're not using AC current in the household to help one breathe. So that's called sleep apnea. Whereas narcolepsy is the one where you're, you're awake, maybe at, on the job, at your desk, and you just fall asleep. Okay, And it's very difficult to control. Um, and it has to be recurring. So if it's a once in a while thing due to lack of sleep, that would not be called narcolepsy. But it's um, narcoleptic. It's narcolepsy if someone has recurring episodes of this okay um, all right let me move on now here when we talk about any of these sleep disorders uh, how do we know you know the, is there a universal way of for a clinician to diagnose these problems and yes there is and whereas medical professionals use a type of standard where they have to check off lists of symptoms for it to be diagnosed as a flu versus the cold versus an infection of some kind. Psychologists and psychiatrists use a book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. That's called the DSM. And now it's in the version 5, right, the fifth edition, so it's called the DSM-5. And when I was in school, I think we used the DSM-3R, DSM-4, and now we're in the DSM-5. And these change over time based on research. Now, this book does have a little bit of controversy around it because there are some fringe groups who believe that psychological disorders are not, do not exist, that these are just individual differences and that we should not label them as disorders or diseases. But for the most part, clinicians and psychiatrists who are MDs uh, utilize this book to, to aid in their diagnosis. You cannot just rely on the book. You gotta use clinical interviews and maybe blood tests and other kinds of eyewitnesses uh, and a, to c arrive at a more accurate diagnosis, okay? So you cannot just use a survey or just go into this checklist for sleep disorders and see if someone has that, but it's, a, it's part of the equation, okay? So in this section of the chapter, we're gonna talk about substance use disorders right and notice the word substance is used not the word drug because it could be a drug and it may be something that's not really a drug like it could be paint uh, or another substance that can give someone a high for example uh, alcohol is not technically a drug but it's a, we call that a substance right now dependence is what we normally think of as the word addiction okay there are a couple kinds of dependence we could depend be dependent on something physiologically that is when we stop using it whatever that it is then we experience withdrawal symptoms when we stop using it okay that is a cycle of physiological dependence that that your body literally craves it okay so that happens with nicotine it can happen with caffeine, of course, with stronger drugs as well. Now, psychological dependence is more of a crutch and an emotional need for that drug. So even if your brain chemistry is working normally, 
but yet someone just has that urge to want to use it for some reason maybe for uh for escape for example maybe someone's not a full-fledged alcoholic chemically speaking but they want to rely on it to escape whatever emotional pain they're experiencing now what's also related to these substance use disorders is also tolerance so a tolerance means that a person needs an increasing amount of whatever that substance is to achieve the same effect okay so tolerance is usually related to that physiological dependence okay and also withdrawal when someone stops using it they suddenly have a, a flurry of negative symptoms when the drug is discontinued and that this tolerance and withdrawal plays a part in why addiction is so powerful and so difficult to uh, relieve oneself of that okay of that particular disorder and during my training years in the VA hospital working with a variety of patients the ones I felt the most empathy for and sympathy for were those who are in treatment for uh, substance disorder they may have developed it developed it during their combat years in Vietnam or in the Gulf um, or they become dependent on painkillers from an injury and it's really the worst thing you can wish on someone because these are like PTSD they're invisible disorders when you see someone a combat veteran and you, you think they're acting normally and they're fine but deep down they're struggling every day with this but it's invisible you can't see it on their face is not like they're missing a limb or they're in a wheelchair where there's a physical disability or injury where an onlooker would immediately know that this person is suffering in some way or uh, had an, a negative experience but if someone has this ongoing and it could be an ongoing lifelong struggle for that person to overcome addiction um, the best thing is to avoid it to begin with right um, if possible but it's really challenging for the people who are trying to overcome this so in, there are different categories of drugs legal or illegal substances that end up in these categories that affect our mind or consciousness so there's stimulants there are depressants there are psychotics and hallucinogens okay and so let's take a look at this chart here that has these different classes of drugs so again these drugs can be illegal or subscription or street illegal drugs right so we have the category of stimulants cocaine is an example of that meth right uh, even the medication Adderall for ADHD patients okay caffeine and nicotine are stimulants as well uh, and basically a stimulant means is that it's going to increase central nervous system activity okay so it increases brain activity whereas the opposite of that would be a depressant now a depressant don't associate it with depression it just means that it's depressing central nervous system activity it's slowing down brain activity that's why anti-anxiety drugs like Xanax they're slowing down brain activity right when someone's anxious they're thinking too much uh, they're, they're overwhelmed with worry whereas the anti-anxiety drug would calm the brain down kind of like a fire hose or a blanket alcohol is an interesting case because you know sometimes people uh, confuse it with a stimulant because they think of going to a bar or a party and there's alcohol served and everybody's hyper afterwards or loud well what they're missing is that alcohol is a depressant because it's decreasing your inhibitions so when you're alert and you're very aware of your social environment you're more inhibited that is you're not gonna scream for no reason <laughs> you're not gonna dance on a table right you're, you're gonna maintain your sense of control so when alcohol gets rid of that armor you have of defenses then all of a sudden it's like bam you're, you're doing things you don't normally do but alcohol is a depressant it lowers central nervous activity okay and uh, barbiturates benzodiazepines right all of these are considered 
antidepressants and they decrease one's heart rate and blood pressure so they're the opposite of stimulants okay opiates these are our body's natural uh, well the, when you talk about endorphins and neurotransmitters but opiates are narcotics right so they can be used as painkillers legal drugs like morphine um, heroin the street drug it serves the same effect right oxycodone the painkiller a lot of prescription painkillers are opiates okay uh, and that's why they need to be controlled because they're very effective now this is something I didn't have a chance to talk to before in a previous chapter but essentially if I were to give someone an anti don't do street drugs talk I would not say that don't do drugs because they are bad I know that sounds a little controversial, but what I would say is that don't do drugs because they're too good. They're overly effective at what they do, right? In our everyday experiences, we have endorphins that kick in that give us this euphoric high, right? Maybe by running or playing video games or doing everyday activities, right? But when someone uses heroin or is using a painkiller, the level of the neurotransmitter created in the brain and in the body is way more than what we can naturally produce. So then over time we, we crave it, whether physiologically or psychologically, we want that high. And suddenly everyday activities become more boring and less exciting and you don't really want to do it. And that's, that's a sure sign that someone's becoming addicted to something is when what used to produce pleasure through normal activities, even sexual activity, no longer interests that person, but the only thing that interests them would be to use that drug, that chemical that can produce this extreme high or euphoria. And so when someone uses a pain reliever for a back surgery, recovery, or back pain, or whatever injury, and all of a sudden they can't stop using it, right? So that's why one has to be very careful of the amount of this medication they're using for legitimate purposes. Then the last category of these drugs that we'll talk about is hallucinogens. And that includes marijuana or acid, LSD, peyote, okay, mescaline, okay, uh, these types. And what a hallucinogen does is that it changes our perception in some way, right? It might make one hallucinate, affects one's vision, affects one's reaction time, okay? And there are a variety of ways that any of these drugs can be consumed, whether it's directly in the bloodstream, inhaling it as a, like a cigarette, snorting it, um, placing it under the tongue. Um, there are a variety of ways that, uh, including, uh, uh, okay, well, I'm trying to find the correct word for that, but as a repository, like anally, right? That, that's also a method of, Basically, it has to break the skin-blood barrier for it to get into the bloodstream. So through the digestive system or through the airways and the lungs, right, there are a variety of ways of getting a drug into the body. Now, there is a particular drug, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's used in Asia quite a bit. It's betel nut. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's basically a red paste that they place inside a, a betel nut. Um, that they chew it's similar to chewing tobacco in the west okay and then once you're done chewing you spit it out so you see these red marks on the ground and and uh, in various parts of Asia it's still very popular it's legal they have little booths along the side of the road that you can buy it and mostly it's for industrial truck drivers who are trying to stay alert right so in America you might have truck drivers using caffeine pills or whatever to stay awake drinking coffee but in Asia, they will be chewing, and especially in the rural areas of many countries, they'll be chewing betel nut. And you can Google that and find out what it is. But it's, I believe it's a stimulant, I'm pretty sure. And my uncle in Taiwan was talking about how he recalls that, you know, he used to chew, but he doesn't anymore. And many people, it, it can cause uh, mouth cancer and damages your teeth and so forth. It's really quite uh, ugly cosmetically. Um, when someone's using it, but when they're addicted, they don't really care. You just keep chewing it all day. And there, there was a person my uncle said was addicted so much to betel nut that they would actually slip a betel nut um, 
under their tongue when they went to bed so that when they wake up, they would already have it in their mouth. It's kind of like someone who's addicted to smoking who would just stick a cigarette in their mouth when they go to bed so they wake up, they can just light up and have a breath of nicotine, um, an injection of nicotine first thing in the morning. So that, that is really a severe case of addiction when you're sticking in your mouth already when you go to bed so you can wake up and immediately have it in your system. And it's still legal even though it's frowned upon in many Asian countries and you don't see it as much in, in urban areas in the city because there's nowhere to spit, right? If you're trying to maintain cleanliness, it kind of, you know, if you can't walk through a shopping mall and then just spit on the ground, right? It's nasty. Um, but you see it outdoors maybe in some areas and uh, it is cr really quite an ugly sight, unfortunately. Now, caffeine is the most widely used stimulant in the world, right? It's in coffee, which is one of the biggest um, products in the world. Uh, and uh, a lot of people might think it's cigarette smoking, but way more people use caffeine than nicotine uh, when you compare it by the population, okay? And I love coffee, so th this is uh, more or less a harmless kind of addiction for many people. Although I recall when I taught in the classroom, there was a student who would come every morning with this 32 ounce jug and I'm thinking are you drinking soda every morning he's like no this is my coffee I'm like wow that's a lot of coffee by the way some people assume that a strong tasting coffee equals more caffeine and that's actually the opposite the darker the roast the less caffeine is in the coffee bean okay it's been roasted out okay so strong coffee actually is the light roast has more caffeine right the, and and even though the levels may not be that significant but if someone drinks a lot of coffee every day and they're thinking give me a strong coffee i think they're mostly referring to the strong taste thinking that that really strong bitter uh aroma of dark roasted coffee is going to jolt them to having more alertness but that I think is more of a placebo effect it's really the light roast that has more caffeine in the coffee bean okay that's your coffee tip of the day right there okay so um, again we can talk a little bit about opioids we kind of talked about that before there's uh, uh, methadone is actually used as a medication for those trying to get off of morphine at the VA hospital I worked at uh, veterans would line up in the morning when the methadone clinic opens and these are heroin addicts who are trying to overcome that so you cannot quit heroin cold turkey or uh, even a heavy alcohol user should not quit cold turkey it can be quite dangerous the, with, the physiological withdrawal symptoms can be quite hazardous to your health so it's something you have to wean yourself off over time um, even nicotine, I'm not saying it's dangerous, but someone who's a heavy smoker and they go cold turkey and quit. The, the rule is, is that, and, and I, I was part of a research team at MD Anderson in Houston for uh, smoking cessation and tobacco research, so this is something I understand fairly well, is that for someone to quit smoking, they really have to get through that 14 day, 7 to 14 day withdrawal period, right? Where chemically the body's craving nicotine okay? and that's why people use the gum or use a patch so it's a substitute right some people are using e-cigarettes these days but um i'm not sure those who use e-cigarettes are really i have to look at the science on this uh, whether it's effective in reducing cigarette use um, it depends on how they're weaning themselves off and whether they're under the care of a physician but in any case, that I wanted to mention that in terms of opioids, that methadone is a legal opioid that's helping someone to uh, decrease their use of heroin over time. And these class of painkillers is also called analgesic, right? So many of our over-the-counter analgesics are having the, have the same purpose of trying to reduce pain, okay? And lastly, we can talk about hallucinogens that create hallucinations. So uh, any hallucinogenic is going to cause an, 
a change in our sensory and perceptual experiences. Sometimes they can be very vivid, such as seeing things crawling on the wall that aren't there, but they look very real. So we may have visual hallucinations uh, that are very common. And, uh, and so obviously this has a lot to do with our brain chemistry and affecting our neurotransmitters. Okay? And uh, of course, our, in the heyday of the 1960s and 70s, where drug use was quite, street drugs were quite popular, um, there's some talk about how hallucinogenics can have many treatment functions. That's why marijuana has become more legal and become medicinal for pain management, for example, and for other disorders to reduce nausea. And so um, this lecture is quite different than we did 20 years ago where most of these kinds of things were considered illegal and bad, but now there are more legitimate medicinal uses for many of these categories of drugs. Okay, I think we're done here, and that's those are the topics I wanted to cover in this chapter called Consciousness. I hope you uh, were able to pace yourself through this and, and uh, get a better understanding of some of these subjects. Um, as a coffee drink, I think I need to reload my coffee, and uh, I, I appreciate your time, and thanks for listening. And I'll join, and uh, I'll see you in the next podcast.